Shanine? Yes. Are you going to do the PowerPoint slides yourself or should we do it for you from here? Well, if I do it, I can, of course, move them, right? Without having to ask you. Yeah. Um, but then I would need to share my screen. Yeah, you can share documents from your lab. Um, let me see where I do that. Um, share screen. Yes, I can probably do that. Let, let's see if that works. Okay. Shall we start in three minutes? Yes, please. Okay. Ratirta, who are here today? 500 students and? Um, I'm not sure about that. Okay. Media will know more about the information. Okay, kita mulai ya. Acara siang hari ini. Uh, boleh tolong tenang dulu di ruangan karena kita sesinya kan hybrid kebetulan uh, Profesor Sianin Ubing dari Leiden sudah hadir bersama kita juga dengan Mbak Tirta selaku moderator Mbak Tirta saat ini sedang di Sydney Hello Good afternoon Good morning Good morning. Good morning for me. Good afternoon for you. Yeah. So thank you so much for attending today's session. But first, let's give a round of applause for our speaker today. Kanadira boleh di zoom audiensnya. So right before you, Professor Shanin Ubing is around 500 new students. They are in their first semester this year at the Law Faculty Universitas Indonesia. And it is such an honor for us to have you for today's lecture, also in line with our Dies Natalis celebration. So without further ado, teman-teman uh, Professor Shanin Ubing adalah professor di Leiden Law School. She is also the president uh, of the International Commission on Legal Pluralism. So we are extremely lucky to have her as our speaker for today. So, Mbak Tirta. Yes. Mbak Tirta is currently in uh, UNSW to do her PhD, and she will be the moderator for this afternoon. So please, Mbak Tirta, the floor is yours. And once again, uh, let's start the discussion. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Mbak Dia. Hi, welcome, Professor Janine Ubing, um, online, um, and the students uh, that are in the 
um, auditorium of faculty of law. And I can't see who else is there. Maybe Ibu Sulis and our colleagues from um, Department of Law Society and Development. Oh, welcome all. Um, so today we have uh, Professor Shanin Ubing, who will be speaking about the importance of an interdisciplinary approach in the curriculum of law school. Okay, um, so before that, I would like to introduce Prof Professor Janine Ubing, um, as previously mentioned by Mbadia. Um, she is an expert on um, law and society, legal pluralism, customary law, traditional authorities, transitional justice, rule of law reforms, gender and land management. Um, and she focuses most of her work in African continent, um, in Ghana, in Malawi, um, Somalia, South Sudan, South Africa. Um, she is currently serving as the interim vice dean of uh, research at Leiden Law School. Um, and she is also president of the International Commission on Legal Pluralism. She has published numerous works. Um, she has a book um, called in the Land of the Chiefs, Customary Law, Land Conflicts, and the Role of State in Peri-Urban Ghana, published by Leiden University Press in 2008. But she also has edited several other books um, and articles, mostly on her works in Africa and on the topics of customary law, legal pluralism, and so on. Um, so the topic of the importance of interdisciplinary approach in the curriculum of law school, I think is never a dull um, topic because of the way the world works today um, with globalization, technologies, and sad to say even the war now. Um, so uh, especially for legal scholars, I think we still need a comprehensive uh, approach in seeing legal problems, not only on the local levels, but also international, um, cross-culture, and multidimensional. So without further ado, um, I would like to invite Professor Janine Ubing uh, to speak on the matter. Um, the screen is yours. But um, before, I would like to, uh, for the participants on online, uh, if you have any question during the um, session, feel free to pop your questions in the chat box. And for the participants in the auditorium, uh, we can wait until the session is uh, finished. The floor is yours. The screen is yours, actually, Professor Janine Lupin. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, st students. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, thank you very much uh, to uh, Badia and Badita for this kind introduction. And thank you also to the law school for uh, the invitation to speak to you uh, all here. Um, this is, of course, one of the advantages of technology that I can speak to you here on a Monday. For me, Monday morning, 8 a.m. I was the first one almost here at the law school at 7.30 uh, and to continue with my day uh, afterwards here in Leiden with all my meetings here. Uh, although, of course, we could all say it's one of the drawbacks of technology because maybe otherwise I would have nicely been in Jakarta and didn't have to go back to my work at all. Um, I have been asked to speak to you about the importance of an interdisciplinary approach in the law school curriculum. And uh, being a social legal scholar myself, uh, this is a topic close to my heart. Um, and as the interim vice dean uh, at the law school here at Leiden University, uh, I can also share with you that this is an important topic of conversation in the Netherlands at the moment as well. So let me try and oh that's not going well let me try and uh share my screen and then i want to go here yeah. is that working yeah Hello. okay good um so this is the topic for today um and i think if we look at the the challenge of the law school it is that we need to educate students who have both uh, deep understanding, deep legal knowledge of the content of law. Uh, so they need a doctrinal approach to law, uh, but also uh, students who have the ability to, um, to collaborate across many disciplines. Uh, because most of today's complex problems 
cannot be solved only by law, which makes sense because most problems are interdisciplinary, right? So you also cannot deal with them if you uh, only focus from one discipline. Now, this idea is um, expressed in the term the T-shaped lawyer. Um, and in short, a T-shaped lawyer is a person who has deep legal expertise uh, represented by the vertical bar of the T. Um, and then there is the represented by the horizontal bar of the T. We have a solid grounding in another subject. And this other field of knowledge could range from law and society, technology, business, um, human resources, politics, or more. Now, the picture you see is Professor Elaine Mack, uh, a Dutch uh, professor, not uh, from my uh, law school. And in her 2017 inaugural lecture, she addressed this issue of the T-shaped lawyer. And she wrote the following. Like so many other phenomena, the idea of the T-shaped lawyer has its origin in the United States. There, the call for a new type of legal professional has emerged some years ago in response to the challenges of technological development, changes in the market for legal services, and new ethical dilemmas for lawyers in a complex society. The T-shaped lawyer, it is argued, is able to cope with these challenges based on deep legal knowledge and skills, the vertical column of the T, combined with broad knowledge of other disciplines and academic skills, allowing for collaboration, the horizontal column of the T. Now, she continued, she started with saying that it came from the US, but she continued to make an argument for the need to uh, educate Dutch law students also to become more T-shaped lawyers. And uh, I think just like in Indonesia, the original approach really was one very much focusing on uh, doctrinal uh, teaching, uh, focusing on the content of law. Uh, but this change is slowly being made to, to become broader. Now, for me personally, the need for more versatile, more interdisciplinary lawyers became very clear when my own institute, so within the law school, I work at the von Vollenhoven Institute for Law Governance and Development. And we were developing a, a master in law and society a number of years ago. We just started the fourth batch. So we were developing this five or six years ago. And in order to get our master program approved by the ministry, we needed to show uh, that there was a labor market potential for our prospective graduates. And for this reason, we undertook... Can I just ask everyone who is online to turn off their microphone because we're getting some um, extra sound. Thank you. Um, so for this reason, we undertook a series of uh, interviews, both individual and group interviews, uh, with a variety of potential employers. And these included agencies from central and local government, European and international organizations, development agents, national and international NGOs, uh, but also consultants, banks, and multinational companies. And they basically all told us the same story, that for some jobs, they needed to hire lawyers because it needed to be someone who understood legal norms and procedures, but that it was often frustrating that these employees knew so very little of the functioning of law and the operation of the rest of their organization. So how law operates in society and how society influences the formation and operation of law. Um, and one of those organizations that we talked to was the Dutch Academy for Lawmaking. Um, now, you will probably not be surprised to hear that when laws need drafting, uh, this is often done by lawyers. Uh, and yes, lawyers are the people who know about precise wording, who know about legal impact of certain formulations, uh, correlation or, or uh, cohesion with other laws, etc. But why do we make laws? We make laws uh, in the hope to influence behavior, right? But how much do we learn? How much do our law school curricula teach us about how law influences social behavior? So I want to go a little bit into that uh, topic. And I would like to start with uh, Professor Sally Folk Moore. Um, 
who already in 1973 warned us against uh, simplistic thinking behind much legal instrumentalism. And by legal instrumentalism, I mean the idea that law is a tool for social engineering. And of course it is, it is a tool for social engineering, but not one that is as simple as, oh, we want this outcome. So we put it in law, we put it on paper and that makes it a reality, right? Writing something on paper has not yet changed reality. Um, so she shows how innovative legislation or other attempts at direct change often fail to achieve their intended purposes and or carry with them unplanned and unexpected consequences. So she starts from this idea that uh, law isn't capable of fully controlling the social context. It will have an impact on it, but likewise will society have an impact on law. These two influence each other. Now she tries to explain this to us uh, by coining the term the semi-autonomous social field. Um, and in her opinion, in society, there are many social fields uh, and these, these overlap. One person can be in more social fields. You can think of a rural community with its own customary laws, a religious group with its own religious norms, but also all kinds of industries and work fields, um, whether we're talking about the, the garment, the clothing industry, or stand-up comedians or French chefs or sports associations, etc. So all of these fields, she just terms that very broadly, social field without defining what is that. But what they have in common is that they often make their own norms, their own internal norms and rules, and they have the capacity to make new ones of those. But they also have the means to induce or coerce compliance. So if you don't follow those norms, you probably won't be welcome in the field anymore. At the same time, that doesn't mean, of course, that they're completely self-organized. That's why they're not autonomous, but semi-autonomous is that they are vulnerable to or affected by rules or decisions from the wider world. Um, and that wider world obviously includes the state and its law. Um, so she first tells us this in abstracto, but then goes into two examples. One is the garments, the clothing industry in New York, uh, and the other is the customary law and land law system of the Chaga in Tanzania. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit about her example of the garment industry in New York. Um, and what she shows is that this industry has various norms that differ from state law, uh, and that people largely follow those norms, those non-state law norms that are made internal to the industry. And of course, she asked the question, why are these rules obeyed if they are not legally enforceable, right? You can't take them to a state court to get them um, enforced. So writing about this New York garment industry, one example she gives is around the agent of the labor union agent, right? So there's a labor union and the business agent from the labor union. Now his job is to see that union rules spelled out in the basic union contracts are obeyed. Think for instance of maximum hours of work per week. Now in reality, in this business, people work many more hours than the union contracts stipulate. And the reason for that is that um, this is a field where in some times of the year, some months of the year, there is lots of work. And in some months of the year, there is very little work. And that of course has to do with the cycle of fashion. So fashion changes every year. So we have the spring fashion and we have the autumn fashion. I know nothing about fashion, but that I know. Um, and um, therefore at two peaks in the year, there is lots of work and at two phases in the year, there's very little work. Um, so everyone basically agrees that for this business to be profitable, it only works if in some periods of the year, the garment workers make much more hours than they're supposed to do according to the union contracts. And everyone's basically willing to do that because that's the only way this industry can function. So these rules in the labor union contract uh, that are enforceable in, at the state court are not obeyed. But, she asked, does that mean the union agent is powerless? 
No, it means, on the other hand, that he is powerful because the existence of the rules and the possibilities that he would go to a state court for the enforcement gives him power because he, he actually has the power to also not enforce these norms. Uh, but he could make trouble and that gives him the power. Sally Folk Moore gives another example, the contractor. So this is where the cloth is cut and the dresses are made. And the contractor then delivers his clothes to what they call the jobber. Now, the jobber is the one who designs the clothes, but also who then sells these garments in uh, the showroom or displaces them there, uh, displays them there. So the contractor, the one who delivers the, the ready-made garments to the jobber, of course, has a legal right, according to contract law, to ask for direct payments of his bills. But obviously, the jobber hasn't sold any of these clothes yet, so it would be very hard for him to immediately pay for the garments that he hasn't sold himself yet. So the contractor doesn't ask for direct payment. But again, does that mean that he's powerless? No. The fact that it is his legal right to ask for payment makes it a bargaining tool not to ask for payment, right? So that actually gives him power. So this is sort of how she sees uh, the semi-autonomous social field. We're all within the social field or possibly within several. And the social field influences the legal field. And the legal field, she mostly talks about that lower uh, arrow. The legal field sometimes infiltrates the social field. Uh, a bit more complicated picture that I found is this one. Uh, don't pay any attention to the words in it, but what you see is that there are all these different autonomous, semi-autonomous social fields and people can be in different ones, um, but they can also partly overlap with legal systems. Now, what are the important lessons on the relationship between norms in the social fields and state law that Sally Folkmore wants us to draw? First of all, that while the operation of a social field is to a significant extent self-regulating and self-enforcing, this does happen within a legal, political, economic, and social environment. And some of the rules about rights and obligation that govern the semi-autonomous social field will emanate from that environment, including from the government. So state law is a part of this picture. Now, why is the field semi-autonomous? Because sometimes the outside forces, such as state law, impinge upon it. But not just impinge. So it can, state law can enter into the social field uh, on the initiative of the state. But it can also enter into the social field because people inside a social field can mobilize these outside forces um, or threaten to do so in their bargaining with each other. Now, many state laws are only made operative when people inside the affected social field are in a position to threaten to press for enforcement. Um, and when actors do push too far, so when all of a sudden the workers have to work 80 hours a week, people can still go to state law. Okay, so why am I telling you this? Um, because... Um, Sally Folkmore was trained as a lawyer, but also as an anthropologist. And it was her understanding uh, from anthropology of the functioning of certain groups in society that gave her new insights into the functioning of law. Now, why was I telling you this whole story about the semi-autonomous social field and the New York garment industry? Because we were talking about the necessity for lawyers to understand not only the content of norms, but also the operation of law in society and how law relates to other aspects in society. And another book I want to tell you a little bit about is the work by Benjamin Van Roy and Adam Fine. And for a full disclosure, uh, the nice guy in the black and white picture is my partner. Um, so they speak of the relationship between changing behavior and existing social norms. And they argue that it is much easier to change behavior via law if you understand the existing social norms and adjust your messaging to it. So they distinguish between descriptive social norms, that's our perception of what other people do, and injunctive social norms, which is our perception of what other people think we should 
or should not do, right? Now, let me give you an example. Um, the first is an example where um, the, uh, there is a, a, a neighborhood in uh, the US and they would like to reduce the energy, uh, the amount of energy used. So what they do is they post messages on 300 front doors of houses in the suburbs with these four norms. So one quarter of the houses has the message, energy conservation helps the environment. The other quarter, energy conservation benefits society saves money is common. So four different messages to one quarter of the houses. Now, my first question to you, and I'm going to need some help from uh, the audience here, but also from maybe from uh, Badia um, to tell me, because I would like people to raise their hands. So look at these four things. And my question to you is, which one do you think will be most effective so which of these four leads to most people reducing their energy uh, use? Um, so I don't know, uh, Badia, can you, can you ask the students um, to raise their hands at the first, the second, the third, and the fourth, and then report back to me on which one they find most and least effective? Or am I making it really hard now? Well, at the moment, there are two answers in the chat um, message, uh, Janine. Mm -hmm. um, they are saying number two. As most effective. Yes. Okay. Now, what does the... What do the students say? But Dia, you're inaudible. Yeah, you're muted. Yeah. Dia. Muted. We can't hear you. We still can't hear you, Dia? Now probably we yes. can. No. Oh, now it's gone again. Yeah. Who was doing that on the computer? Yeah. Maybe I can. After no, I cannot. Okay. Well, at least everyone has thought about this. So let me just, you know, I'll I'll give you the answer, and then uh, at least you have thought about it first yourself. So what they did next was they actually went um, into um, into the a community and they interviewed the residents. Now, the residents actually said that they were asked which one they thought was most effective and which one they thought was least effective. And what's reported back in the article that the one they thought was least effective was number four, energy conservation is common. They thought that that would not be an effective message. Um, and this was very interesting because in effect, it was the most effective one. And why is that? Because that is the descriptive social norms. Let me go back to my last slide. The descriptive social norm is our perception of what people do. And that is very influential on their own behavior. So if you say it's common, then you're basically telling people, everyone is already doing this, get on board with it. So that turned out to be most effective. Now, this does work both ways because in the next version of this same research, they started telling people what the average energy consumption in the area was, right? So they told them average is, you know, this amount. And then people who found that they were using more energy were indeed reducing. But people who were doing better than that already, who were using less energy, they actually started to use more. So a 
descriptive social norm can also work the other way. If you feel you're doing much more than everyone else, you might actually start doing less, right? So what they did afterwards is they still told everyone what the average is, but then the people who used less than all the others, they, you know, in the earlier version started then using more, but now they were giving an emoji, a smiley. Oh my good, guys, you're doing so well. And you won't believe it, but the simple fact that it was added, that an emoji was added, meant that everyone started behaving better. So the people who were using more felt bad because of the descriptive social norm, right? Because others were using less. But the people who were already using less didn't start using more because now there was an injunctive social norm saying, we think that is really good what you're doing. Um, this makes me feel in a way very bad about the human race that we can be manipulated that easily just by uh, adding an emoji to, emoji to a message. But anyhow, let's, let's keep that in the back of, our, back of our heads. I'll give you another example. Um, there was a daycare in uh, Israel. And in that daycare, um, obviously it closed at a certain uh, point in time, let's say 7 p.m. And... Uh, it didn't happen a lot, but sometimes parents were late. You know, you're on your way to pick up the kids and then you're in traffic or your business meeting runs late. So people were late and they wanted to deal with that because obviously it's very uh, annoying for uh, the, the, the people who work at the daycare also need to go home who can't because there are still kids not picked up. So what they did is they created a fine. Right. So if you picked up your kids now, you weren't just, you know, given a stern look, you actually had to pay for it. And the effect of that was that more people started to pick up their kids late. Um, and the idea is um, they explain this from saying that the social norm used to be that you had to pick up your kids on time and that it was very antisocial for the people working there if you didn't. But now picking up became acceptable as long as you paid the fine. So the fine just became the price for this extra service of coming late. Um, and what they call this is crowding out morals. So by putting a fine on it, they have eroded the underlying social norm that this is something you really should not do. Um, and interestingly enough, when they removed the fine, because obviously it wasn't working, it did not go back to the old, the old, old way with more people picking up in time because that social norm had been eroded and wasn't coming back. Okay. Um, I think I'm getting close to the time I was allotted. So let me see how I end up. So I've given you a few examples of why I think it's useful and necessary that law students also learn from uh, learn a little bit about other disciplines and understand how law functions in society. So Sally Folk Moore uh, had law and anthropology in her background. Van Royen Fine combined law and social psychology, for instance. But I can give you many other examples where legal knowledge combines well with knowledge from political science, public administration, uh, technology, more science fields, etc. cetera. Um, so to, as I said from the start, to solve some of the complex problems of uh, the current society, we need to be able to speak to those other disciplines, right? So that's part of the story. The other part of the story is that I think lawyers are interested sometimes in other questions than people coming from other disciplines. So as a last point, I want to explain that. And I really found this in my own field of study. So in the introductions, people said that I was, um, I'm the, uh, currently the chairperson, the president of the Commission on Legal Pluralism. So I study legal pluralism and customary law in Africa. And that's a field where you see both lawyers and anthropologists working. Um, and I know a whole number of anthropologists doing very interesting work in that field, understanding the local workings of customary justice systems very well, uh, also having a good understanding to what extent the state legal system reaches into that semi-autonomous social field of the rural community. Um, but the thing is, 
anthropologists are oft, anthropologists are often not too interested in some of the questions a lawyer usually is interested in. So I'm really interested in what does it mean for a state? What does it mean for its sovereignty? How can a state function when each community has its own normative system? its own elected leaders or selected leaders, but not democratically elected, um, its own courts or dispute settlement institutions. What does that mean for law in a country? What does that mean for the monopoly over violence in a country? What does that mean for the rule of law in a country? Um, and for the rule of law, what does it mean for legal certainty if each community then has different norms uh, and how do they relate to the state then? Now, these are questions a lawyer asks, but an anthropologist who isn't trained to think from the legal system is much less interested in. At the same time, um, it is the lawyers who ask those questions and are often involved in devising the legal system at the level of the state, who are involved in devising the relationship between state law and non-state law, etc. But often, um, they don't. Lawyers don't know too much about the actual functioning of law in society, let alone of non-state norms in uh, society. Um, even among African lawyers, where customary law really still is very strong in most African countries, I largely find this to be true. There's limited attention at law schools to non-state justice systems, such as customary or religious law. Um, and for a long time, also, customary legal systems were seen as backward in the sense that they were not good for nation building, unification, legal certainty. So then we have the lawyers asking those interesting questions and actually being there at the state side to try and answer them, but often not having the background knowledge to understand them. Okay, so um, this is what I wanted to tell you or share with you about why I think um, we're having in the Netherlands at the moment, these discussions about more interdisciplinary nature of uh, teaching at uh, the law school. Um, we're currently involved in a curriculum revision, and I'm very happy to, to talk to you about this if you're interested in that in uh, the Q&A. Um, and we're also talking within that, and we could also talk about that in the Q&A, but I don't want to take up more time now, um, how there's sort of two ways to do this. One is to have separate courses, sort of law and courses like law and technology, law and society. Uh, but also how to mainstream this in existing courses that do largely take a doctrinal approach. Um, so I'm happy to talk about any of these things or anything else um, in the in the Q and A. But I will leave it at this for now. Great, thank you so much, uh, Professor Janine Ubing, for sharing um, with very interesting examples of how um, law can be perceived in a interdisciplinary um, approach. Um, the energy conservation and the um, daycare. It may seem simple, especially with the daycare, but it actually um, portrays uh, well, how the law works in the society. And anthropology is just one um, field study that can um, enhance law. Um, maybe I could add from my um, example of uh, doing uh, child and law studies that you know, studying or understanding how law works on children, we also need psychology and sociology, for example, um, because reserving ourselves only to law to understand how law works on children just doesn't work. Okay, so um, I would open a session for a question and answer. Uh, if any of you uh, online and in the auditorium would like to ask a question, um, please do raise the question. Mungkin bisa mulai dari yang di Zoom, Mbak Tirta. Um, there hasn't been any question yet in Zoom. Uh, or maybe um, anyone in Zoom would like to ask question? Okay. Uh, There's a hand up now. If, yeah, Yvonne Nafi, Mbak Yvonne Nafi would like to ask a question. Hello, yes. Hello. Thank you, Mbak Tirta. Uh, and thank you, Janine. We meet again. 
Yeah, no. yeah, it is interesting to, to hear about your presentations and thank you. I hope that it's also give um, uh, a different perspective for especially our students in bachelor degree. Uh, I, would, I would like to know about the, uh, because I read one article uh, about the legal research in America and also if I if I have any doctoral fellows here, probably they also experience the same thing, where we found out that apparently America already kind of um, taken this kind of approach in their legal research for a long time ago, but they call it in a different terminology, namely broad legal research, uh, and this scholar said that. U U United Kingdom, UK, on the other hand, they take a sort of a different approach, namely um, narrow legal approach. Like it's more like a doctrinal legal research, uh, legal legal research here. Yeah. Uh, so um, my questions will be: What about in the Netherlands? Because at the moment. Um, UK, I believe that they also already develop a law and society uh, kind of approach. Like they, they tend to, you know, trying to take in that kind of approach. Uh, yeah, eventually, I think it's already developed in the, in the country. In the uh, hesitance from the hesitations from some the the, the older scholars. So I, I, I'm curious what about in, in in the Netherlands? So how long has it been developing this kind of approach? And did it take like quite a long time or a certain efforts to people to kind of accept this kind of approach? Yep. So yeah, that, that will be my question. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, I think that's a really good question. Let me start by saying that we need to make a distinction between what's happening in legal research and what's happening in legal teaching. I think in legal research, the, the movement has for a long time been made towards more law and society. If I law and society approaches, I mean everything, right? Law and that's about how law operates in society. And you might need technological understanding for that, or you might need psychological understanding, or you might need anthropological understanding, right? So law and society approach. And I think this can be explained by the fact, uh, by a number of facts. One is, as I said at this from the start, if you're trying to make your law useful, right? So if you're writing about actual problems that your country or, an, or another country has, then often you find that just the doctrinal part is such a minimal part of all of it that you end up um, going beyond, right? Um, even if it's just um, they started this new, they made this new legislation and what did it do in practice? Or uh, how come we have this new legislation? Or how much political influence has there possibly on the judiciary to come or not to come to a certain type of decision, right? So it starts from that and then it, it gets bigger and bigger. Um, so I think in the research, we have for a long time seen that that broader movement all over all over the world and also more and more I know in Indonesia, right? Um, then I think at the master level of teaching, um, we also see more and more of that. But that's partly because then you have your law school approach or your law, law bachelor, um, and then you might do a law and society master or you might do a master in something completely else and you combine that. Um, the US system is the other way around, obviously, where you do a bachelor maybe in psychology and then you do a master in law. So I, I also taught for five years uh, at one of the UCs, University of California, the one in Irvine. And I, I'm i not quite sure I would say that the 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 the, the U.S. law school is very uh, has a we 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 were one of the law schools with the strongest law and society focus, and even then, um, 
there still is also a lot of doctrinal teaching, particularly because they're coming in from a bachelor from something else, and then they pay a whole heap of money. You all know, right? You, you as law schools are amazingly expensive. So you pay that to get a job that you can only get with a JD, with a, with a law school diploma. Um, so we're in a big difference is in the Netherlands, from all our graduates, maybe 20% will end up in jobs as lawyers or judges. And the other 80%, uh, a lot of them work with law, but not so much with the clear doctrinal law, right? More law and law this, law that. Um, in the US law schools, you only do the top up on law with on a law school that is so expensive if you really want to end up in a sort of doctrinal legal field also as a job. So all of these countries are very different. So thank you for, for bringing that out. Um, where are we in the Netherlands? We've had, I would say, 10, 20 years where sociology of law and everything was cut down on and we got less and less of that. So the funding was cut. It was really hard to, to get those, uh, those courses in. And then probably about 10 years ago, things started to look up again. Um, uh, I think in more subjects, it became obvious that we need to do more interdisciplinary work and that was also clear for law schools. So then we started to get more space for what I call the law and courses. Um, so um, that we have part of the courses that are fully doctrinal and part courses that are law and society, law and technology, etc. Uh, and more funding again for law and society or sociology of law chairs, etc. What is changing now, and I see this also at various law schools in the Netherlands, is that there's also discussion of mainstreaming um, the, the law and society approach. So what I mean by that is that the courses that are originally fully doctrinal, to give them an aspect of empirical knowledge or law and society study. So, so let me give you an example. You have a text law course, right? Now, text law is obviously one where it's really about the norms, right? If you apply this, do you have to pay or not? What is the role? It's very technical almost. At the same time, it will be very interesting to have at least some information on how different versions of tax systems uh, have different effects and different effects on equality or division of wealth in your society, different effects on small businesses or development of the economy. Um, so, you know, you can focus on the system you got and how it functions, but also what does this system, what is it supposed to do? And does it do that? Are there discussions around changes within the system? Um, so this is a discussion we're have, having quite heavily now at our own law school. Um, and we're seeing whether we can have, so each, we, we, we work in blocks, so four blocks a year, each block has three courses. And we're thinking of adding one seminar per week, which in the very first block, probably mostly focuses on learning to learn, learning to study. Uh, how do you deal with three courses at the same time? How do you manage that? But then gradually goes more into empirical questions or law and society questions or sometimes overlapping questions. You know, if you have two courses uh, that to a certain extent speak to the same same thing to really then take an example where both types of law come together because of course we in our courses largely treat these all as separate blocks that have nothing to do with each other right as if you can't have an administrative law and and, and civil law case at the same time um, so I think from 10 years ago, we started to get more funding and more interest again in uh, interdisciplinary approaches starting really from research and from research funding. Uh, this was another aspect that we saw that within the law school, the doctrinal departments have much more difficulty gaining external funding than the ones who do law and technology, law and society, law and anthropology, because they study real problems. So you can much more easily write a gripping proposal saying, we have this big problem and I'm going to look at it from law and usually makes for a better story than 
you know, I'm going to tell you what the courts have been doing and, you know, I'm going to make a normative statement about this. This is just a fact, right? So within research, the departments who were more law and were just much more successful. And then that filtered through. If, if we need to do that to be successful in research, do we then not need to teach our students to be able to, in minimum, work with those other disciplines, right? Not everyone can have a dual degree in law and anthropology, law and, and social psychology, law and, but you can learn how law functions in society and how you can speak to those other departments. So what I said that we did at the start of our law society master, that we had to speak to the labor market. One person, for instance, was from local government, and he said, we need lawyers. We have them in the organization. You ask them something and all they can say is, no, that's not allowed by the law. Full stop. Like, that's not helpful. What does this mean for us? What are we allowed to do? What, what, what can we do within your organization possibly to change that? Or So all of that, I think we need to educate our students better for. And I think that's clearly happening in the Netherlands. Right. Um Beautiful question, beautiful answers from Yvonne and uh, Janine. Yeah. Um, it really shows how important interdisciplinary approach is in law school because um, I think everywhere in the world um, is facing the same situation, you know, the dichotomy between um, one legal law studies and interdisciplinary. But it, it is very important from the example that Janine has given us um, it's shown how important it is. Um, so, uh, we But have to, yes. Ada mahasiswa yang mau tanya, bolehkah? We have students here at the auditorium. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I will also like let the question. Yeah. And then we can go back to the questions uh, in the chat in Zoom. Go ahead, Madia. Can you tell us your name, please? Okay, uh, let me introduce myself. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Iqbal Hussein. I'm from uh, Batch 2023 uh, uh, Kakai program. And uh, my question is, as we know, each country uh, is in different stages of environmental improvement and really different social issues, especially intercontinental countries like um, uh, like the lecturers in our Zoom, like uh, Indonesia, Australia, and the Netherlands. How can le uh, legal teaching and research or this interdisciplinary uh, approach, uh, like a joint research between international institutions, how can they find solutions that can be implemented to both or any region that varies uh, in different issues? And does the solution also vary or will it be a general solution that can be impl implemented anywhere? Thank you. Thank you, Iqbal. Janine, please. Yes, thank you, Iqbal. That's a good question. And I think for me, it's not a, not a hard answer because I think another word for the law and society approach, so for understanding the relations between law and society, how law impacts on society, how society impacts on what kind of law we get and how it functions, how it's being interpreted, how it's being applied. I think another word for that is law in context. So... We, as I said, we have a law and society master, which draws students from this year, I think, 20, 25 different countries. And I think what we do is we teach them the tools um, with which to look at this relationship between law and society. And then, of course, you can apply that to any society, right? So it's much more about understanding how law is made and who's involved and how power is involved in that, and who are the winners and losers. It's about focusing on implementation of law, right? Uh, adjudication, dispute settlement. So it's focusing on the processes to understand, um, to understand better what role can play in solving these uh, difficult problems. So I don't think the outcome, uh, you know, I don't think what we need to teach in law school is this is how we solve the problem of environmental pollution. 
um, I think what we need is an understanding of what role can play in that. And then the actual content of that law will be determined on the local context. But of course, the functioning of law is also determined by the local context. But so I think the teaching um, at many law schools can be in your own national context, but at the same time, it can teach you how to analyze these problems, which means you could do the same in another local context. I hope that uh, is not too abstract and answers your questions, but for me, law and society is a law in context approach, and you can then do that in any context. Um, thank you, Janine. So maybe I will um, go back to the questions uh, in the chat. Uh, there are two questions, um, Janine. One is about the difference between interdisciplinary approach and multidisciplinary approach in law. Um, and second is about how can interdisciplinary approach in law school curriculum um, not only enrich legal scholarship, but also transcend traditional boundaries. Um, that ultimately lead to more holistic and innovative solutions for social, legal, societal, legal challenges and um, the implication uh, it has for the future of legal education research and practices. Well, the first one, the difference between interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary, um, I think it is quite often used um, interchangeably. Um, interdisciplinary is often used when, um, um, you know, someone kind of branches out. So I'm a lawyer. I also do anthropology. That makes my studies interdisciplinary. Multidisciplinary is, is more often, so it's a term much less used here, um, but it would be if there was really a research project designed by, let's say, the um, um, a technical uh, school with a law school and both really come together with two, with questions really that fit in their own field, but also come together. So I don't know, maybe, maybe multidisciplinary is when there's like really experts from all those fields and there's strong questions from all those fields, but I'm not quite sure all of these terms are very, very helpful and they're often used very interchangeably. Um, and I myself usually only use interdisciplinary. The second question um, from Jos, how can an interdisciplinary approach in the law school curriculum not only enrich legal scholarship, but transcend traditional uh, boundaries, ultimately leading to more holistic and innovative solutions for societal legal challenges? And what implications does this hold for the future of legal education? Yeah, I no, I, I think I was already speaking to this. Um, I, I think the whole goal of law and is, and as I was saying, many not many people do law and the other thing themselves, right? But if we understand law and how it functions in society, then we're able to work in interdisciplinary groups, right? If we think about solving environmental problems, obviously a lawyer can be all as interdisciplinary as he wants, but we're going to need people who really understand environmental science and all kinds of other things, right? So I don't think you can expect lawyers to be able to do all of that, but I think we can expect lawyers to be able to work more easily in these interdisciplinary groups. And for that, an understanding not just of the content of environmental law, but why do we have this type of environmental law? Could we take another approach to regulate law, to regulate the environment? What are the advantages and the disadvantages, right? Stricter regulation has consequence for the environment, but also for the economy, also for your international relations. So how all of these come together. So an understanding of the law, how is it made? By whom? What alternatives were there? What are the outcomes? Is it doing what we were hoping to do? Those are questions many original, more traditional doctrinal courses weren't asking. Now, of course, others were, right? If there's a new penal code, then it makes sense to say, how does this differ from the old one? And why does it differ from the old one? Well, usually because these and these were uh, aspects that were considered unsatisfactory. But then five years later on, if that same course is taught, do we actually look at whether it's now more satisfactory or do we not, right? So. 
those kind of questions, and a lot of people do, right? Even in the more doctrinal courses, um, there's already discussion about parliamentary debates around new legislation, um, um, a protagonist and antagonist of a certain change. Why do they feel this is a good thing to do? Or why do they feel it's not a good thing, not a good step to take? So all of that is not just about the norms that, you know, the, the, the big question is, do we start, do we take as a starting point the black letter law that we have now and we want to know how to apply it? So just the internal legal perspective, what would a court do with this? What would a lawyer do with this? Or do we take an external perspective on law? Hey, we have this kind of law or legislation. What's it supposed to do? Does it do that? Who benefits from this? Who loses? Could we change it? What are the alternatives? That broader mindset was really what people in the labor market were missing, were, were saying that law students were lacking at the moment, um, and, and that I think are very um, uh, important. And, and, and this is maybe also what I'd like to give to the students is pose those questions during your class, right? Don't just follow what's being said. Also ask questions about what's not being said. Because as a law professor, I know once you get a question two or three times, you start to think you need to have the answer. And you start to think, oh, maybe I can incorporate that next time in my course. So you have a power as a student, maybe, you know, for the courses to follow your year, but you do have that power to make that change. Right. Um... Thank you, Janine. Yes, um, I think I want to add to that um, Indonesian students has the luxury of having a social laboratory in Indonesia because as a very plural country, uh, Indonesia has so many cultural perspectives, for example, which can be think about during your classes, for example, or when you see a law or a legislation, um, it's really, it goes beyond just black letter law in Indonesia because there's just a lot of aspect um, as Indonesian as a society. I like so, this idea, Batita, to, to talk about it as a social laboratory. So often you use your own country first as that, or your own region even as that social laboratory. But what we then also see in the master is that if you take it one step further, and then you combine your thinking of a country, of your own country and the problems there with another country, then you get to the point where you're like, oh, I thought this was happening because we have A, B, and C, but it's also happening there and they don't have C. Or, but it's not happening there and they do have A and B. And that's why the comparative programs become interesting at a bit higher level, such as the master or PhD. Because then you, I, I've had the same, yeah. I, I, I don't know where you are in your PhD, but with my research, I did my PhD on Ghana. And then I went to Namibia for a postdoc and I was sort of re-asking myself all these questions. I thought it was, but now I'm seeing, hmm, what does this tell me? Not only about Namibia, but what does this tell me about Ghana and my analysis of that and, and how valid was that? So I think you can do that at law school too, that you start small level, yeah. what's happening here, and then at some yeah. point you ask, you know, is that valid everywhere else as well? Yes, exactly. So um, for bachelor students, if you want to use this comparative approach for your final um, thesis, that will be wonderful. I think um, seeing the Indonesian context first would be a great start to you know, kind of like practice seeing things at a, a broader situation. Yeah, and it uh, also might help you if, if a lot of the um, literature on something is heavily US dominated, for instance, as it often is, you know, you in Indonesia need to be able to make the translation. What of this is general? And what of this is US specific? Because the American scholars don't do that, because they're American, they think, and I don't mean to be unkind yes. here, but they think the whole world is like America. Or it isn't, but it doesn't bother them, right? So they write about the U.S. without saying that this is specific for the U.S. So you need to yeah. read that. And that's the same for a lot of Western countries. But the U.S. is very specific and very strong voice, right? <laughs> so, so you need to realize what of what they're writing is specific for the U.S. And what would not hold up when it's placed in a different context like Indonesia. So first understanding law in the context of Indonesia well helps you to think 
oh, but this is law in another context. Is that the same or can we distill the, the law part that, that's valid yeah. and then do we need to look at it in another context? Yes, yeah, we really need to like be criticized of you know the theories, right? Like, example, coming from the US or the Western, because I think also there's a gap between the let's say Western scholars um, because of their um, access to literatures and their experience, and then um, in the global South countries they have different experience with cultures, with diversity, and etc. So um, yeah, it's just one enrichment of um, the law um, society, law studies. Um, in, and this is very in, interesting, uh, Matita, that you even see that in the type of master programs. So you have law and development, you have law and anthropology, that's law in the global south. And then we have law and society, which in the US mm -hmm. basically is law and society in the US or law and society in the Western world. This is really why our master program is unique. I'm not trying to sell it on you, but <laughs> we said, why, why that division? Doesn't it make sense to use literature and theory and case studies, both from the global north and from the global yeah. south, and to have that discussion? What of this is local context specific? And what of this is a general thing you can say about law? And that really is unique. Most people take that apart. As soon as we're talking global yeah. south, it's law and development, it's legal anthropology, yeah. uh, but it's not law and society. And it's definitely not just law in the West, right? So um, yeah. I think that's an important yeah. distinction to make. Thank you. Okay, um, any more questions maybe from the auditorium, Badia? Yes. We have not one. Okay. Okay. So we still have 30 minutes for this discussion. So we have a lot of time. Okay, check. Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, uh, Professor. Uh, my name is Wildan Haris Ramatullah. You can call me Wildan or Harris if you want. Uh, okay, for the question is, uh, for me, I can easily understand the needs for learning social legal for us who has a dream in a public sector, like a lawyer in public sector. But I quite hardly... Uh, yeah, I could hardly find the needs of learning social legal if us who wants to who wants to who has a dream in private sectors. Uh, so can you enlighten us that uh, how uh, how important of learning social legal for us who has a dream to work in private sector? Maybe that's the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Interesting yeah. question, Janine, please. Definitely. Thank you very much, Harris. Um, and I must say that was probably my view of it too earlier on in, in life and definitely as a student. So I very much understand where this question is coming from. And for me, it was also very interesting to do that labor market orientation that we were doing to get an answer to this part, particularly from the more private sector. And what we found is, yes, of course, you have um, the in-house lawyers at uh, big companies, right? And they partly just apply law and they, they go to court and do those kind of things. Um, but what they were telling us is, A, that they need to think much more, I mean, much more with the company on, you know, where law offers them opportunities and difficulties, et cetera. And one good example here is that many uh, firms have a compliance officer, right? If you're uh, a big beer brewery, right? Let's say Heineken. I, I live very close to Heineken, so I smell it every day. So let's say Heineken. And they operate in, I don't know, I think 40 countries in the world, something like that. So they're all over their world, uh, all over the world. And there are a lot of regulations as to what they're supposed to be doing. If we think about environmental regulation, but also to prevent corruption and all kinds of things. And to make sure that they internally comply with this, they have an internal compliance officer, right? So that's all about getting your own company and your all employees to abide by the law. 
Um, so for that, of course, you need to understand the law, but that's not all that complicated, right? It's labor regulation and environmental regulation, etc. But most of that position isn't about knowing the nitty gritty of the content of that law. Uh, it's really about how do I get my own people to follow these rules, to comply with this? Um, other example given was uh, lobbying. Um, large companies do a lot of lobbying at uh, the lawmaker. For that, you need to understand law, but you need to understand lawmaking and you need to understand these processes as well. Um, so, for instance, um, one of our um, um, graduates from the Law and Society Master got a job at a, a big consultant and that consultant helped banks who uh, have a big self-regulatory role uh, to avoid uh, money laundering. Um, so money laundering for a government is really hard to deal with if the banks don't cooperate, right? So what they largely say is they put the job with banks saying, you need to do this and this and this, and we now and then check on you. Um, but that's a whole uh, business for banks to, to, to do well. And otherwise they get huge fines that a couple of big Dutch banks have just gotten big fines for that. Um, so they need people to understand law, but not just law, right? They need to understand how to make this happen. Um, so those are the kind of functions where uh, our graduates end up banks, consultants, uh, big companies. Um, um, I, it's, it's funny because we, we, we all think we're, you know, um, kind of educating them to become very uh, socially minded, uh, good, good, good lawyers. But some of them also end up on the side of uh, big companies. And, um, uh, and of course, we, we need them there as well. So I hope this answers your question a bit. Yes, uh, so uh, even though you are in private sectors, but you are really also engaging with the society because it, it, when you're going to apply one regulation, for example, you're going to do it in a society, a group of society, meaning that you should also know what is the impact, what will be the impact of that regulation. And being um, in multinational companies, for example, like um, Nestle, Procter and Gable, you know, working in different countries. I mean, it's another level also uh, to be able to regulate um, laws from different countries. I forgot who wrote about it, Janine, but Barbie, I think, is a good example. Barbie is a, a U.S. company, but has factories in Taiwan um, and in Thailand for the hair and for the body parts of the Barbie dolls. So it's coming from different countries with different labor regulations in US, in Taiwan, Thailand, for example, it alone makes you need to have a broader perspective of um, the law and the society. Yeah, and you can imagine that also the, 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 the big companies in the West, they are now being told to pay attention. You know, before they would say, we don't know what's happening in Bangladesh. We don't know what's happening there. I mean, we just get these half-made products, right? And they don't get away with that anymore. They're now being held responsible for the labor standards in those other countries, etc. Now, you can imagine you, you yeah. will need some people for that that understand law, but law alone doesn't get you there, right? So your factory in Bangladesh isn't complying with the labor standards. Just knowing the labor standards doesn't make them change, right? So if we if we think yeah. again of Sally Folk more social field, obviously these are social fields. So why are they not doing that? Is that not profitable or who's gaining, who's losing? How can we change those processes? You really need to understand how to make change, which is something different from just knowing the law on paper, so. Yeah, exactly. Like child labor, you know, the West see child labor is a big no-no, while the Bangladeshi uh, see child labor is, you know, like additional income, very important to the family, for example. Yeah. So if this is norm, if this is locally seen as, you know, not not a bad thing or maybe bad, but you, there's no choice, uh, then you know, most likely there will be very different social norms around that than the legal norms. How do you how do you deal with that pluralism? Mm -hmm. Um, so better understanding of that. And then again, it doesn't need to be solved by a lawyer on its own, right? Yeah. But what I often heard back was we have a lawyer in the team who can only say, that's not the law. 
yes, that's okay with the law. That's not okay with the law. Mm -hmm. And that's just, you want that person to go beyond that and, and, and yeah. to have a better understanding of what law does or doesn't do or how, how a law can be communicated or translated or made operative. Um, and for that, we need a more interdisciplinary approach. Yes. Okay. Um, any more questions from the auditorium? Yeah, Matilda, we have, I think, uh, one question. Is it okay? From the yes. uh, ON Society master's student. So uh, the question is, in Indonesia, interdisciplinary legal research experiences extraordinary challenges. How would an interdisciplinary perspective be accepted in academic circles because many people think that legal positivism can provide practical benefits more rather than the interdisciplinary approach. Okay. But, uh, and Janine, thank you so much for your lecture. I've really enjoyed it <laughs> alongside with the uh, students here at the auditorium. Thank you, Budia. Um, simple question, right? How, how can we convince everybody? Um, I think there's an important role for students here. Um, when, when we had a pre-discussion about this, this meeting, this session, um, one of the people there from UE was telling me, students come in with some of these questions, right? They already come in with the question about the relationship between politics and law, right? What kind of law comes out? Uh, maybe also uh, influence of the executive on the courts. Um, questions of access to justice and um, how law relates to justice and fairness. Not all law is just or fair, right? So I think people, every, you know, thinking person already has those questions. And I think partly what we've been very good at at law schools is to get them out of your head, right? Because one of the things you always hear at law schools is, no, we need to make them think differently. We need to make them think as lawyers. And by that, we mean with a focus on the internal perspectives of law. What's happening within this legal field? How would a lawyer see this? How would a judge see this? You know, how, how would a judge answer this question? How could a lawyer argue with this way or that way? Um, so I think, and, and once as a teacher, you've been doing that for 30 years, right? It's, it's, it's not very easy when someone tells you you need to do something different. So I think it helps when students keep asking those questions. Okay, so I've learned all of this about, you know, applying these and these rules, but why is this rule chosen? Why is this approach chosen? Uh, what does this mean for certain groups? So keep asking those questions. As I said before, when, when I've two years on a row had certain types of questions, I, I incorporate them in the third year with an extra article on it or, um, you know, uh, an extra discussion on it because it's something that's living in the minds of students. So I do think that the younger generation itself um, needs to ask those questions. And other questions are, Okay, so now we know, you know, this part about environmental law. Um, what else do we need to know to really solve this? Um, what else do we need to know to be able to work in interdisciplinary teams? And maybe that's not, you know, maybe that's also something to take on, particularly at the level of the master. Um, but I think you have to tie it with you. I mean, in, in the Netherlands, if as I told you, it's the labor market asking for it. I think if we look at current society, it's the complexity of all these problems that ask for interdisciplinary approaches. Of course, there's still, there is, there is a field that requires doctrinal legal knowledge, right? If you're gonna be a lawyer, add really a law firm arguing in front of the court, then that's what you do if you're gonna be a judge. So there's a few others where that is the case. But for us, as I said, that's about 20% of the students ends up there. All the others, some end up not working with law despite having a law degree, but many end up working with law, but in a broader, uh, broader spectrum. Uh, and for all of those, uh, it's gonna be a benefit if they know, know more about that other field. So keep asking questions. That's my big answer to everything. Right. Uh, so, do we have any more questions? 
um, from online participants or from the auditorium. But let's check. Um, uh, Ibera Hadi Yoga, do you want to ask a question? No? No, no, thank you. Okay. Um, but yeah, any more questions from the auditorium? Uh, we're good, I think. Yes. Okay. Um, so if there are no more questions, um, thank you so much, Janine, for enlightening us and giving us maybe more burden to think about. So, um, uh, yeah, untuk Professor Sianin Ubing. So a big round of applause, please, for um, yes, Professor we're giving Janine you Ubing. A big round of applause. I hope you can hear it from this. <laughs> yeah. So it is a lot to think about, but I think it's a good thinking um, for all of us. I think it would be better um, for law students, for lawyers to have a broader perspective, interdisciplinary approach um, in seeing. So I hope it, this is useful for um, especially bachelor students in the auditorium as they are just starting um, their law degree. Hopefully they will evolve um, and become, you know, like interdisciplinary perspective lawyers that will understand more the labor market. Um, so once again, um, thank you all for joining um, this public lecture, especially thank you again, Professor Janine Ubing for early morning sessions with us. Um, and I hope you have a good day forward uh, this day and with all your um, meetings. But yeah, back to you. Yes. So I think we're reaching the end of the uh, international lecture by Professor Shianin Ubing. On behalf of the faculty and most of it on behalf of our new students who are now at the auditorium, I would like to convey our sincere thank you, Professor Shianin Ubing, once again. Hopefully we can meet offline face to face soon. <laughs> we'll be more than happy to welcome you at the Universitas Indonesia. So have a good day, Mbak Tirta. Have a good day, Ibu Shanin. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, okay. thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Tadi yang tanya satu lagi siapa mas? Boleh ke depan tulis nama sama NPM-nya ya. Thank you.